No one listens when you get horrendous symptoms and clear tests. Getting a medical pro uh, profession to understand possible issues around pregnancy. Right? I mean, the biggest problem with being a TOF is the doctors, I think. Because <laughs> almost certainly you know more about the condition than they do. And when doctors don't know much about a strange patient with a strange illness, some of them get very defensive. Right? You know, it's all in your mind. Yeah? And, you know, Caroline, I've just been talking to, Caroline's written a fantastic article in the BMJ, um, uh, and I wrote a little bit about it as well. So if you look at Love and Maurice and the BMJ, you can get it up. And, uh, it just details all of the problems that she had earlier on because nobody understands what's going on. And it's worse the more specialized the doctor is because doctors are trained in silence. And the problem with TOF is it's a disease of the esophagus, but the consequences end up in the lungs. So you go and see a lung doctor, and they don't know what the hell's going on, and you go and see uh, a GI doctor, but you've got a cough, and you're bringing up phlegm. It's nothing to do with me. So you're between two stools. It's a tremendous difficulty. Um, why did I get into it? Well, I got fascinated by cough. And uh, that was because well, there's people out there with a horrible cough. And so I learned a lot more about cough. But nobody's interested in it or hasn't been interested in it. So it would be me with a poster at one of the meetings. And I would be in a corridor and nobody would talk to me. Right? But gradually, certainly in the UK, cough and this particular condition is being much more uh, widely recognized. So there's about half a dozen uh, cough doctors around in the country who actually know a bit more about it. But you go to America, you might as well talk to brick walls. I mean, they just don't understand it. So you're quite fortunate being in the UK. We are getting there. We're getting somewhere. So I, what I've done mainly is just brought along some patients uh, for you to see. So uh, uh, this is David, and he's now age 39. And he presented after birth with inability to swallow. And in his notes are the original notes from the operation. And you can see he's got a trachea, and the esophagus is joined onto the trachea. Now, why does this happen? Well, in evolution, the lungs are just outpouchings of the gut. That's how, from when fish came out of the sea, they uh, didn't have lungs, but the lungs developed out of outpouchings of the, the uh, uh, trachea. And so that's why TOF is a pro common uh, abnormality. And in this diagram, you can see there's a big missing gap in between. And then the diaphragm is in the right place. And this bit here, the gastroesophageal junction, it's crucially important for the diaphragm because the diaphragm holds that valve there closed. So if, as uh, happens in David, what they did was they tied off the end up there when he was born, after he was born, and fed him through a tube into his stomach. Fine. He'd have no problem, really, with that. And then about 18 months, he had a chronic colonic transposition. Now, I'm sure all of you know that. You take a lump of colon, whack it up here, and make that gap, fill that gap with the colon. But the colon isn't the same as the esophagus. Right? The esophagus is an incredibly complicated organ. And it's not very well researched. And in fact, uh, the great John Winnicombe, who was the man who invented the science of cough, who sadly died about 10 years ago, he used to say, the esophagus is the most under-researched organ in the body. So there's an enormous amount of ignorance out there because nobody's ever taught about anything about it in medical school. So he had recurrent cough and chest infections. So what you'll go along, you'll get an attack and go along and the doctor will listen to each sound of the chest and they'll say, oh, you've got a chest infection. What else could it be? And so they come to see me and they've had chest infection after chest infection. I say, that's bloody unlucky, isn't it? Perhaps it's not a chest infection. They go, oh, but well, that's what the doctor says. I said, well, 
They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> he also had lots of vomiting as well, and he developed bronchiectasis, and we'll talk about bronchiectasis in a minute. Coughing attacks, difficulty swallowing. How could this possibly be anything to do with a chest infection? Uh, just, even though he gave the wonderful history of eating and it causing these attacks. I mean, it's, if, you, if the doctor is capable of asking the right questions, it is blindingly obvious what's wrong. It, just that they're never taught to ask the right questions. So I did a uh, talk to the um, registrar doctors in Yorkshire on uh, Thursday. And I was sort of saying, well, do you ask them whether they get coughing attacks with eating? No. Do you ask them whether they get a funny taste in the mouth? No. They're not taught to do any of this. Right? And by the time I'd explained it, there was a little like this. Nobody has ever mentioned this to them at all because the chest doctors are worried about asthma, whatever the hell that is, and uh, COPD and other lung diseases, because they're being taught in their silo about lungs. Right? And you go to the gastroenterologist and say that there's something wrong there, and they do the acid test, and there's not much acid coming up. So you haven't got reflux. Wrong. Right? What we're talking about is not acid reflux. That's different. Acid reflux is the tip of the reflux iceberg, right? What often happens is non-acid reflux comes up, and in particular, often it's a gas or a mist. You can't see, even see it when you do a barium meal or whatever. So he was given antacid treatment. Right, evidence that that works in coughing? Well, I've done an experiment, randomized control, da, 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 and it doesn't work at all. It's not the acid that causes the coughing. So giving something which, if you do have heartburn, that will eliminate the heartburn because these drugs are brilliant at blocking acid. But the problem is, it's not the acid that's causing the coughing. So there's no effect on coughing. But you say to an average doctor, how do you treat reflux? They'll say, give you a PPI, lanzoprazole, omeprazole, that sort of stuff. I suspect most of you are on it. Right? In fact, it increases the amount that goes in the lungs. It's probably doing you harm rather than good. Unless you've got really bad heartburn. And then probably ranitidine, which is much milder, is probably the better treatment to give if you do get attacks of heartburn. So I took uh, some ranitidine this morning because I've got a bit of a GI abscess. Um, reflux. His reflux, i.e. his acid symptoms, doctors call it peptic symptoms, are much better because that's because the acid's blocked but he's still refluxing and aspirating away, getting these chest infections. <clears throat> so he had uh, repeated gastroscopy, uh, esophageal dilation, because when they pull, uh, when they put the uh, um, colon in between the two, often the bits that join up, fibros up, and so it becomes, causes a blockage. So things get trapped in the, esoph in the now colon, which is now the esophagus, or the replacement of the esophagus, and it comes back. So it's not gastroesophageal reflux, it's esophagopharyngeal reflux. And when it lands up here, it sets the nerves off. The nerves become super sensitive. So you get set off by things like change in temperature, strong smells, and bleaches and perfumes, and that sort of things. You know, I sat next to this lady on the bus, and she was wearing cheap perfume. It's always cheap perfume, it's an expensive <laughs> perfume. Right? And the cheap perfume set me off. And that's because the nerves up here are irritated by this reflux. It's a hypersensitivity of the nerves up here. And that's why there's coughing going on. Despite not having a reflux episode, you get set off by, you know, some people get set off by going past the cold uh, shelf on the supermarket. So the change in temperature, because there are temperature receptors on the end of these nerves as well. So she, he was referred to the, the cough clinic. And just to illustrate what we found, we did a CT scan, and 
This is cutting them across like that, right? So that's his windpipe there, as I mean, his trachea, right? That's the front, that's his backbone there, right? And you can see this big dilated colonic transposition there. So it's about that big, right? Whereas it should be that big, right? And opens when the food goes through. But in fact, it hangs there. And you can see all this white stuff here. That's all the food residue sitting there in his colonic transposition. So when he lay down, it all poured out. It's simple. But nobody could understand it. Let's try this. So, as human beings, we're particularly prone to this sort of problem, right? We're unique in many ways. Um, but here is my daughter, um, who's now 21, so it's not uh, an old photograph, and there's our old dog, right? So we are the only genuine bipedal animal. Right? We walk on two legs. No other animals do that. Uh, Hannah says, what about kangaroos, Dad? And I say, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can see the dog isn't really suited to it. Right? So what happens in a dog is the esophagus runs along the backbone and then goes through the diaphragm where the bowel is, and then the stomach hangs vertically. So there's a right angle between the stomach and the um, esophagus. Whereas in us, the esophagus goes down, and then there's a valve, but the stomach's right below, right? In fact, the diaphragm tries to pull the esophagus backwards in order to recapitulate what the dog does and all of the other mammals, right? So this is a high-pressure zone, particularly in me, right? And this is a low-pressure zone, right? We're trying to draw the air in. And when we draw the air in, we tend to suck stuff up from the stomach if that valve is knackered. Right? And as you saw, when they did the, the operation, they moved his stomach up properly, and the valve is now no longer held closed by the diaphragm. So he's got an incompetent diaphragm, uh, valve above the diaphragm. So that's the pathology as far as the uh, esophagus and... Uh, 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 some of it's concerned, but here, when the, when the reflux gets up here, we also have a problem here as a human being. Right? Human beings are unique, in mammals anyway, because we talk. My dog tries to talk to me, but it's not very good. <laughs> got a couple of words. So what we've got here in mammals to prevent stuff going down the wrong way, I mean, why do we have a cough reflex? What's the purpose of the cough reflex? It's to stop stuff going down the wrong way. Whoever designed this bit of the body was an idiot. <laughs> right? Put the food pipe and the windpipe together? Crazy. So we've got a valve here. In, this is a pilot whale. Soft palate, epiglottis, retinoid cartilage. Those three things provide the valve. Same as in a deer, soft palate, epiglottis, retinoid cartilage. Here's a cat, soft palate, epiglottis, retinoid cartilage. And here's a spider monkey, soft palate, epiglottis, retinoid cartilage. So what do we do that none of these animals do? That's what I'm doing at the moment. We talk. Right? So babies don't talk. So if you've got a baby, soft palate, epiglottis, and retinoid cartilage, right? So babies, they, they reflux all the time. You know? We've got a word for it in English, positing. Right? And uh, Irish call it mother's medals. Yeah. Right? But they're protected because they've got an intact valve. But as we go towards adulthood or, uh, and learn to talk, the soft palate moves away from the epiglottis and the retinoid cartilage to allow this space here for us to enable us to make the words. Right? So not only do we have a tendency to reflux, we also have a tendency to aspiration. So when you've got a pile of stuff coming up from the esophagus, it comes up here and falls in there. And you get wheezy, and you start coughing, and you get rattly, and your doctor puts a stethoscope on, and you can hear all the crackles. It's a chest infection! No, it isn't. So here's another of my patients. This is Scotty. 
He's uh, one of our Hull uh, regulars, you can see from the uh, um, flash jacket and the cap. I, I love this next uh, slide. So he's got a tattoo. Oh, you can't see it protected very well. You can have the lights down. Yeah? Is the lights possible to have the lights down a little bit? Anyway, it's got an H, a U L L. But unfortunately, the tattooist, which may have been him, has put the H U L L, and the U is that way around, and the L is that way around. Right? So, whichever way you look at it, it's wrong. <laughs> Yes, but well, at least he spelled Hull correctly. <laughs> anyway, I love Scotty, he's a great guy, right? And a uh, father and uh, a very attentive father. So, which side does he sleep on? Well, we're looking from the bottom, so this is the right side here, right? And that's the left side. He sleeps on his right. Yeah. So what's happened is that the stuff's poured in, it's damaged his breathing tubes here, but since he doesn't, it doesn't go down that side, there's hardly any damage on that side. So you can tell how, in the clinic the other day, I looked at another lady, not, not a toff, but it was bronchiectasis all on one side, I said, I bet you sleep on your right side. And my husband said, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> So the stuff pours in, and in some people, it damages the breathing tubes, leading to the dilation of the breathing tubes. You see, these are, see, these are the normal size here, and that's the size that his has become. And that's called bronchiectasis. And what you've got here is this bronchiectasis then gets filled, these tubes get filled with pus and muck, right? So he's got a permanent low-grade infection going in there because his breathing tubes are filled with this uh, mucus. Uh, we can get it better with antibiotics, but he's colonized now with Pseudomonas, which is a difficult bug to treat. If we'd been able to stop the aspiration which causes this, then it wouldn't have happened. But Scotty's, he's got one lung perfectly all right. I keep on saying, you've got one lung. Don't, stop complaining. <laughs> oh, but I'm going to die. I say, We're all going to die. <laughs> So the, the lady who gave the psychology talk, that was perfectly right. Yeah? Absolutely. So how do you diagnose it? Well, if you, if you want to go and convince your doctor, and you can't really see this, this is www.issc.info. Uh, www right? And that's a, a website that we've got. It's about cough, mainly. But we've got this questionnaire which is thoroughly validated and passes all the tests that the medics like and it gives you a series of questions. Now the thing is that some people answer very positive to other, one question and then negatively to another question. Right? But those people who are, have this cough and aspiration will often have, for example, hoarseness or a problem with your voice. I get that myself. They clear their throat a lot. They have mucus in their throat, fetching and vomiting. It's very positional, as in Scotty. You get it when you lie down in bed. But when you get off to sleep, if you've got an intact valve, it tends to go away because the valve closes. Because the vagus nerve slows the heart down and it closes the valve to stop it happening at night. Um, heartburn and indigestion is the least positively answered question because it's not necessarily an acid reflux. So that's the least positively answered. Uh, cough with eating. I noticed a couple of people coughing after you've had your coffee there. Right? We all do it. We all reflux after a, a meal or a bit of coffee or something. And what we do is we drink air or eat air as we eat food. And then the stomach sorts it out from the uh, food. And about 10 minutes later, the valve is told to open to allow the gas up. Right? And then that hits the back of the throat and you cough. So it's a typically a cough 10 minutes after the food. So I say to the patient, do you cough off the food? And they say, yeah, oh, yeah, I do. I say, well, how many minutes approximately on average is it? And I go like that to the medical student. And the patient says, oh, it's about 10 minutes, doctor. And I go, <laughs> but the medical students, none of them know about it. This is something we do, a normal physiological thing that we do every day. But medical students are never taught about it. It's crazy. 
That's because cough isn't important, it's just a symptom. Um, when you get out of bed in the morning, again, the valve is told to open by the vagus nerve to allow the gas that's been trapped in the stomach overnight to. Uh, so often people will get out of bed and have a horrible coughing attack and then gradually get better over the day. Singing or speaking, that's the diaphragm waggling that valve. Uh, coughing during day rather than night. Strange taste in the mouth. Is that familiar to some people? What's it taste like? It's often metal or blood. But sometimes people just say it's horrible, nasty taste. So one of my other patients said, uh, yeah, it tastes like shit. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you know? <laughs> anyway, most people will be, normal people score four, right? If you've got airway reflux, as I call it, you're probably over 14, right? And sometimes we get 60 or even 70. I've had 70 on occasions, right? So not everybody has the same pattern, though. If you score naught, don't worry. Some people do score naught on some of the questions, but other people score uh, five on them. That's what confuses people. So uh, this was kindly said to me by one of the uh, patients who I've uh, corresponded with recent, uh, remotely. And um, this illustrates what's happened. She's had a uh, repair and uh, is in a, an adulthood. And so she's been to see the chest doctors, right? So the chest doctors, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to have a look at the chest. Yeah? So they've got this, this is in the, in the trachea, the main breathing tube, windpipe, and there it's going off into the left and the right. And what we've got is where the, the uh, fistula was, there's this little ridge here, and you can't actually get through that, right? But the doctors think it must be the stuff collecting here and going in. Come on. But they're chest doctors, you see. They, they're, they're looking at the chest. Whereas in the patient's notes, they have a uh, small heart, sliding high into hernia, which is where the valve is in the wrong place. High into hernia is where your stomach's in your chest. Uh, on formal prone assessment, a well-coordinated primary esophageal peristaltic wave was not seen. So translating that, there was no swallow. Right? So the esophagus, they call it, I call it naked esophagus. She's got a naked esophagus, right? So although the repair has been done expertly by the surgeon, the nerves and so on are not coordinated anymore. They can't repair all the nerves, and they can't get the muscles in line all the time, right? So often, there was, for example, this is pooling of barium in the mid and upper esophagus, with proximal escape of barium into the esophagus, upper esophagus. So what's happening is she's swallowing and it's sticking there and then coming back up. Chest infections, yeah. So, there is a test that we can use because often people will get gastroscopies or bronchoscopies or you know, cameras down, right? And they don't really help very much, right? What we need to know is about the movement of the gullet. Sometimes a barium meal, when it's gross dilation like, like we had with uh, our first patient, David, I mean, you can see the big dilated esophagus, or dilated colon in his case, right? But in people with relatively normal-sized esophagus, where it's been connected up, we can have this test. So this is called high-resolution esophageal manometry. Uh, and there are, you know, most large teaching hospitals have it now, of course, we have the best kit in the, in the country in Hull. And what we've got is a swallow. And you can see this is a top valve at the top of the gullet. And then it opens to allow the water through. Right? And the patient swallows. And there's a nice contraction of the gullet. This is the heart beating against the, the uh, machine. And this poor person has no valve at the bottom. Right? So we can see there's no valve. But if you look down, you can't tell that. So it needs the pressure test, the high-resolution esophageal manometry. So that is a absent valve at the bottom. But this is more typical of someone who has TOFs. Here we have a swallow, and it starts off OK. The top half is OK, and then nothing happens in the middle bit. There is no contraction at all. 
And this purple stuff is water. We can measure it with our Ampines machine, which we put on top, right? So that you can see the water just sits there in the esophagus, right? And that's prone to be going back up and down as a mist or as liquid water. And here's another swallow, but this is a much better swallow, as you can see. And afterwards, all of the water's gone, and you can see there's not hardly any water there at all. So they've cleared it with their second swallow. So the first swallow didn't work, all stuck in the gullet. And then the second swallow, it did work and went down. So I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, science here, because doctors are mystified about how this can cause damage. Right? It's obvious if you've got a tidal wave of stuff going into the, to the lung, like Scotty had. Right? But most people have only mild bits going in, little, little particles, bits of gas, mist. Right? And what happens is these bits of mist, the little particles, land on the epithelial, the lining of the breathing tubes. Right? And when that happens, it gets eaten, right? and it releases various chemical messengers. Right? And in some people, in about 10%, it produces the allergic cell. The allergic cell, the eosinophil, comes in, and it looks like asthma then. It's not proper asthma, like I understand it, but it looks a bit like asthma. Right? Whereas in the majority of people, they get a different sort of inflammation, which is more like chronic bronchitis with the neutrophil. And then a lot of people also have the nerve being irritated, right? so they get this hypersensitive nerves. So they get set off by these other external things, but it's because they've got a hypersensitive nerve. I mean, it's like having a burn on the skin. You blow on it and it hurts. The same thing is happening up here in the throat. The nerves are super sensitive, so external things will set people off. So this allergic cell is a very interesting thing. In kiddies' asthma, you've got allergens, you know, cats, dogs, house dust mites, that sort of thing. Right? And it has the allergic protein on a cell called a mast cell, and that calls in the eosinophil. But only in the last four or five years have we now known that there's another mechanism for bringing in this eosinophilic cell called um, uh, innate immunity. So it produces a different set of chemicals. There's no mast cells, no allergy, and you can still get eosinophilia. The doctors call it eosinophilic bronchitis. But the great thing about this is that we've got drugs now which treat it very well. A lot of you will be given prednisolone, right? And if prednisolone works in three or four days, if you're brilliantly better after three or four days, this is what you've got, right? This sort of aller uh, allergic type response, but it's not an allergy, right? Uh, because this cell, the eosinophil, responds brilliantly to steroids. Double you can't be on steroids all the time. But now we've got drugs which we can give, mainly injections, which whack this cell completely. And I've got a series of about 10 people who are dramatically better. But of course, the government have made us fill out stewed forms left, right, and center to get it. So it's a right pain. But on the other hand, the patients are dramatically better. <clears throat> However, most people don't have that. Most people have the other chronic bronchitis type pattern where you produce mucus because the cells are landing, uh, the reflux is landing on the epithelial cell. So we've got drugs that can help. Metoclopramide, domperidone, these are both two common anti-sickness tablets. And some people respond very well to them. Right? What they do is tighten up the valve, if, it's the, if you still have a valve, and it prevents the stuff coming back up. It also improves some of the movement. Baclofen is another drug which is hardly ever used, but I use it a lot, which also tightens the valve up and gets the movement going. But perhaps the best drug is this drug, azithromycin. Azithromycin is an antibiotic, so it kills two birds with one stone. If you do have a chest infection, right, you go along, the doctor says, oh, you've got a chest infection. I say, you say, can I have some azithromycin then, please? <coughs> because then that will trigger them thinking, oh, yeah, treating the chest infection, right? But in fact, what you're doing is treating the reflux, because azithromycin mimics the hormone motilin. Motilin is one of the hormones that drives the gullet and makes it work better, and it also drives it through into the stomach. Right? So 
this azithromycin, most patients with cystic fibrosis, with chronic bronchitis, um, with uh, bronchiectasis, have azithromycin. So if the doctor says, you shouldn't be on it long term, oh no, I've given people it for years, right? And azithromycin, when it works, doesn't work in everybody, but when it works, it can be a dramatic effect, right? So azithromycin, one tablet once a day, it's dirt cheap, and it's a um, phenomenon that's been uh, ignored by some of my uh, colleagues because they're chest doctors. What do they use? They use inhalers, right? And why give an antibiotic all that time? Oh my goodness, you might get resistance. Well, you, you do get a resistance to azithromycin, but not to everything else. Right? So this tablet, cheap, easy, is far under-prescribed for people with coughs. And you can try it for a month or two and see whether it works. I mean, you'll probably have been diagnosed as asthma because you're wheezy or whatever, right? But I don't understand asthma. But it's, if you read the literature, the old literature, so this is from 1888, right? Uh, and uh, George Congreve, 1881, sorry, George Congreve. There is also a dry or nervous asthma, because he calls it asthma, with little or no expectoration, accompanied by flatulence, headache, restlessness, dryness of the throat, intense anxiety. In most cases of this class, dyspepsia, and he thinks it's so important, he's put it in italics, right? Dyspepsia is like an accompanying evil and perhaps the exciting cause. Right? I wish they'd write like that. It's you know, beautiful English, right? Uh, and he is, he, not, nothing that generates flatulence should be taken. Food should be light and nourishing. Uh, pastry seems to set it off, he says. Stale bread. Uh, he recommends a very small quantity of best brandy. <laughs> and Alka-Seltzer as well. So, he had the right idea in 1881. Right? But because we're in silos, medical profession ignores us. So just to show you the, the evidence, this is a New England Journal paper uh, in COPD, because they haven't done it in TOFs, but it'll be the same in TOFs. This is the number of attacks that the people are getting, right? The exacerbations, right? And you can see that's the placebo, and the azithromycin has a dramatic effect, right? That's far better than any of the inhalers at preventing these attacks. So. If, you want, if you're not on azithromycin, you should really give it a go, because it may well improve if you're having lots of coughing and chest infections. That might well be the thing that helps. All right, sir.